I have a couple of questions, if I could, not comments, but just questions, maybe, which Steve did. I'm mean, particularly, because what you said was new to me, but maybe it would help raise some questions. Um, uh, I guess, obviously, this would require a commitment from citizens beyond just voting on election day. And so that raises a question <coughs> as to uh, how many citizens in, you know, would be willing for that effort. Uh, it involves not only a commitment of citizens, but with the complexity that we have of issues today, I'm really looking for an alternative, so I think it's, it's worth exploring uh, anything. But uh, with the complexity of the issues today and the depth of knowledge that goes back, and even the legal knowledge required on a lot of issues, how do you think about addressing uh, the quality of I mean, we've got citizens participated in the election of Trump, you know, but they enlist, they participated by responding to fake news with indiscriminately. And how do we address that issue of quality of citizen participation as well as more than just the superficial go out and, uh, going out on election day and voting for a person, even though he's giving contradictory views to everybody and he calls for goals on which he has absolutely no plan or approach. So how do we, uh, how do, we do that? And I'd just like to ask uh, two other questions. And then uh, one is, uh, what do you, I, I understand the problems of political parties. Do you see a role for political parties in this or is it to completely bypass them? And the last is, do you see that in some way this could address the issue that I raised this morning about truthfulness in politics? Because, uh, I mean, we're seeing in a more exaggerated form, at least, than I have noticed in the past. Uh, Trump, and, Trump is not alone, of course, he's a, a breed. But go and say anything, because by the time people find out that it's not true, you've said four more things that they, so uh, you keep ahead of the wave of, uh, of being caught up uh, by telling people what they want to hear. Bar so, Boris Johnson and Brexit spring to mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Winston, and then we'll, we can move around. Uh, uh, Briefly. What I found exciting uh, uh, about the evolution of constitutional thinking and political culture is that the presentation you bring integrates political and legal culture and makes it therefore not only accessible but vitally important to the survival of democracy and accountability and the other elements of good governance that are, I think, essential to the survival of democracy. On your one, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little confused because the simultaneity of, of agreements at the international level has got a particular problem, and I'm not quite sure how ubiquitous it is, but generally speaking, after states agree to something, say, at the UN level, then it has to undergo another tedious process of going back home and having it ratified. The United States is the absolute worst case of this because it goes to the Senate, and the Senate may take years to ratify the damn thing. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure how that plays out in other states, but most states say that sovereigns are going to have to have a second step of taking another look, and, and that undermines that principle of simultaneity that you talked about. That's all. Yeah, but, well, yeah, if I can just, just quickly sure. answer that. By the time we've got to that stage, mm -hmm. what you've got to remember is that the number of citizens that are going to be behind ah. this mm -hmm. is probably, well, it might not be a majority, but by that time, mm -hmm. it's going to be so many mm -hmm. that politicians ain't going to have any choice but to get on with it and ratify it if they want to survive at the next election. All right. Well, the presentation that were uh, fascinating to me, uh, knowing that the political process uh, of some, for example, in Italy and the United States uh, and in France, uh, where I have lived and worked, uh, it came to mind that the simple, uh, although as Gary said, it was not clear how it would uh, actually work out uh, concretely, which I would like to 
uh, understand that, and I might be personally interested. But at least uh, it is uh, surely uh, capable, as you presented, uh, to be an interesting form uh, of the democratic lobby. I can see that uh, uh, um, uh, the other question for both uh, is, uh, although it sounds very good, uh, uh, when you say politicians uh, do not have uh, any other choice uh, than uh, to do uh, you know, what is convenient to them, uh, on one side uh, it's uh, very good. Uh, on another side, it's very bad, you know, because ideally a politician is somebody that honestly goes there not to sit no matter what and vote what people want. Actually, understanding what people want and having been in politics, like somebody from the Democratic Party said, and was one of the two. Uh, children of Matteotti assassinated by fascism, he said, oh, my electorate, all they wanted from me were illegal favor, pension, when they didn't have uh, no. any right to receive. So, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, I mean, it's not a criticism, it's, no, a, no, question. No, no, no. it's a good Well, question. but uh, if uh, we devise an effective system to coerce a politician, Aren't we having already gave up the idea that somebody goes in politics to make a better world? No, we don't, because what, we, what, we, what you have to remember is that Simpol is only dealing with global issues, only with those issues that nations cannot handle alone. So it doesn't infringe on national sovereignty in any way. In fact, it extends national sovereignty because uh, it actually makes possible some of the policies that nations would like to implement today, but cannot because of the fear of competitive disadvantage. That's right. But, but the, other, the other point I would make, um, uh, Arthur, is that, is that so, a lot of the politicians have signed up because of the, uh, uh, let's say, the gentle, coercive power of Singapore. But many have signed up in safe seats. Why? They just think it's a good idea. They just think it's common sense. They actually feel kind of liberated by the idea that they can actually support uh, these global objectives in a way that doesn't compromise national competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, but, but, but you are right that uh, every technology can be used for good or evil. Mm -hmm. and. Um, built into the founding declaration of Simpon <coughs> is that um, a majority of citizens would need to, um, in each democratic nation at least, would need to agree to the policies before they're implemented. So it's kind of safeguard. And I mean the other safeguard is that Simpon only has any power if citizens support it. If, if the officers of Simpon get caught with their pants down or with their, their fingers in the till, that support evaporates, and if that happens, Simpol just goes poof, you know. So there's a certain accountability there. Yeah. Um, right, uh, Thomas. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask a point a bit about the role of uh, independent think tanks, uh, because, I mean, the, the think tanks that, that are very influential in Australia, and what's, what's in the US, and the UK, often those, like the Minerals Council, for example, in Australia, which articulates the views and interests of the mining industry. Uh, they, have, they have loaded this money and their activities basically uh, uh, to influence the media, to issue press releases, uh, to, to launch campaigns, to, to propagate those views and therefore to gain political support. They also do lobbying. Um, then there are party-affiliated think tanks. But as an independent think tank, what's your strategy uh, to, to, to be effective? Well, I, don't, I, don't, I assume you don't have huge sponsors. Uh, we have no sponsors at all. We have no, absolutely no money. Um, <laughs> 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 No, our, our, 
purpose is to try to create a, a different political culture, a different democratic culture altogether. Now, there are many examples of baseline participatory democracy in all our countries. I can mention um, flat pack democracy in Froome, Somerset, Topney is a transition town, Ungersheim in Alsace, Bristol. There are many, many um, instances of participatory democracy. The problem is to synergize these into an alliance for progress, which could be crowdfunded but it would essentially be funded by people's enthusiasm and energy. Um, the reason why they're not, that the reason why they're not actually an effective political force is because s demand, whether it be in, in um, economics or um, politics, is simply not syndicated. Supply organizes our lives and is highly syndicated and highly funded. And the point is, to get a citizen's movement going on the basis of what already exists, and our purpose in ECUP, the Think Tank, is to provide them with a unifying narrative. Some story, which is what Zhao talked about, the future of democracy, some story they can begin to believe in. And that has to be a consensual story. I think it is possible because most people's concerns are pretty well identical. They're basic concerns from one country to the next. But this is, we have taught the talk. We have thought, thought the thought, which I'm not sure that <coughs> many other think tanks have done. Now we have, as John would say, to walk the talk, which is much more difficult. And that is why we rely upon you to give us feedback so that our narrative can be improved, made more universalist, more acceptable to the average citizen. Um, and that, this is the beginning of something rather than uh, uh, a stage on the way or anywhere near an end point. The war, the war for participatory democracy has begun, as it were, and this is a raised flag around which progressive forces everywhere, in England, for instance, we have uh, a large number of people who would assent to what we uh, propose in terms of participatory democracy with representation and elections only used for the purpose of representing the will of the people which is already democratically defined, right? But um, we now need to bring these forces together and I think we need some kind of, um, <coughs> yes, okay, some kind of um, uh, we need to, de to develop right now a strategy, and that is what, um, what we are asking you, not only to improve our narrative, but to help us develop the strategy, which will bring people together. Uh, Alexander, yeah. yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentations. They are extremely thoughtful and uh, uh, interesting, and uh, give a lot of... Uh, food for uh, thought for the future. But uh, uh, frankly, so far, I am uh, not uh, convinced. And I will tell you that the reason of that is that uh, it's methodological. I simply do not believe that there is such a magic button which you just push and uh, the uh, democratic system is reset to original values. It doesn't work like that, in my judgment. And I think that, uh, as I said, that representative democracy as a system largely has outlived its utility. And we have two options. You know, one <coughs> option is to try to extend its life, the other is think about the alternative uh, systems. And in my judgment, I think that uh, uh, representative democracy should be given the right for euthanasia. <coughs> mm -hmm. Because uh, extending it life, its mm -hmm. life will only extend the mm -hmm. agony mm -hmm. for democratic system itself and for the people involved. But anyway, since I promised to Gary, I will just a couple of ideas yeah. that can extend 
the law. I think, first of all, regionalization. I will not be going to, in detail. If you are interested, we could talk directly. Local governance. Separation of power, not only horizontal as we have today, I mean, executive power, legislative, and judicial, but also vertical, and I would say also international. Here I will give you a couple of uh, ideas that uh, I, I will generalize a little bit. First of all, uh, vertical. They need the uh, more clear cut separation of power between the federal level and uh, uh, the levels local and uh, uh, regional levels with giving uh, or um, giving more rights to the lower echelons of, of uh, that uh, building. Next, uh, and international, we are today electing, electing, electing. America has a huge <coughs> trade with China. It is dependent on many things in Japan, and vice versa. Why don't we start electing an American court, or they start electing an American Congress? Five, ten, American, I don't know. American what? Congress. Congress. Uh, uh, several deputies from China, from Japan, on a uh, reciprocal. Uh, system. So the, the interests, the ideas, they uh, are represented in uh, this parliament as well. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, I would say, of course, the, uh, there should be some kind of uh, ruling that will prevent any bargains of freedom for security. Because it's one of the most dangerous things that is happening and undermining uh, democratic system. Could you repeat the last sentence? I missed the Bargains of freedom for security. I mean, what today, you know, everybody, big brother, surveillance, and they explained that, that we need uh, sort of give our freedoms for our security. So that will should not be acceptable. And maybe also the creation of internet of politics. Because we have already Internet of Things, we have Internet of Energy, and given the blockchain and uh, things like that, we can easily go in the direction of Internet of Politics, which will give a direct access, uh, immediate trans transmission of the information, and so on and so forth. But these are all palliatives. They do not uh, work for a long period of time. They uh, you know, simply sort of we follow the recommendation of Ralph uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who said democracy is finding proximate solution to insoluble problems. Thank you, Ivo. Ivo, yeah. 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 Uh, how would you how would you uh, evaluate the U.S. decision uh, about the Paris Agreement? from the point of uh, uh, democratic background. If we are speaking about the international level, that is a uh, right of uh, each subject to, to express its will. But uh, also from the national level, it can be a question of course, and uh, um, how do you see the possible uh, involvement of, of the simultaneous, uh, simultaneous uh, policy within this uh, example? Well, I, I, mean, I, think I already said it. I mean, I think, I think in some ways, Trump, you know, everyone is blaming him. But in a way, you know, if you look at it from a sort of pragmatic, self-interest point of view, the US has the highest level of carbon emissions, it will have the highest costs to reduce it. It has a nil incentive to cooperate. Um, and therefore, he, you know, his, his decision to leave the agreement is regrettable, but not entirely a surprise. Um, but I also think that, that even the countries that are staying in the agreement, if you look more closely at what they've pledged to do and what they are doing, 
uh, you know, they are not exactly uh, whiter than white. So, you know, I don't think it's an agreement that this going to work. Why? Because it doesn't, it's not based on self-interest. And this is the difference, I think, with Simpol. Simpol is based on self-interest. It's how do you, it's simultaneous implementation, so nobody loses it out. It's mixing two or more issues together so that uh, what nations may lose on one issue, they can gain on another, so that immediate action is in their interest. If the agreement is in their interest, so will verification and enforcement measures uh, to be agreed also be in their interests. Uh, and then also you need the citizen pressure to make it happen. If you have those three ingredients, you know, you, you have a different paradigm really for, for international agreement making. Whether it will work or not, Evo, you know, I, I don't know. You know. But it depends on whether citizens uh, you know, get, get caught by the, the imagination of the citizens gets caught by it and then if they if they take it up. Um, that missed, obviously. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, that missed in in the cut in, the, in this case. Why? No, no, no I'm just uh, saying or that is the or that is the uh, Democratic result or the result of the democratic expression of uh, all, all uh, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think democracy comes into it uh, because it, 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 in, in America, because even though many people may, may want America to stay in, if Trump decides to say something different, then you know, they, they, that's weird. That's part of the problem is, is, is the citizens have no input, no real uh, binding say uh, on, on the global level. Eric, yeah. I find both approaches uh, very interesting, but uh, uh, it seems to me that the empowerment of uh, the democratic machinery might be have a negative impact, a feedback to the society. Let me give a few examples. If you uh, empower the government to impose a tax on financial transfers, the financial system may evade, at least partly. Yeah, yeah no, I come uh, later. This, uh, the other one is. Um, let us suppose, uh, suppose the government uh, will abolish students' fees. You know, universities should close. A third, a third example is uh, also uh, concerning the international relations. Um, if you have a taxation like in Eastern Europe, which is extremely low, flat tax and things like this, uh, people want to have this. Also, the governments uh, will impose it. So, many of the neighbors would be uh, scared of the flee of the industry uh, to those countries, or the taxation is changing in a region at least uh, in the neighborhood. So what I mean is by this example is, is simply we have the power of uh, the population as society as a whole, they have some demands, they are enforced by such procedures to impose on the society and different areas of the society things which may uh, question the functioning uh, and even a good transition in the new society. Well, I think the, the view, the alternative narrative requires our thinking outside the box. We have at the moment uh, elected representative 
democracy, which is in no sense democratic at all. If you're a representative, as I learned from working 40 years with the United Nations, you have to have something to represent. Okay? It's very important to realize this. Now, what you as a representative in theory represent is the will of the people. But unfortunately, the will of the people has not been articulated yet. You have representatives in Parliament who have nothing to represent. You have, for example, I wrote something here. Um, we've basically got back to front elected democracy, which must be replaced by a radical institution of participant democracy, which can only be done by constitutional provision. You will have rules in the Constitution which, which define the public space, which includes citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries, which already exist, but they've got no teeth yet, because we are still dominated by politicians who get power, and then, once they're elected in power, they say, well, what do I do with it? <coughs> Their only purpose in being elected is to remain in power. So it's a, it's, it's a simply a zero-sum game. But what is lacking, the reason why our systems don't work as democracies, is because participant democracy, the will of the people, has to be expressed and articulated. And once it is, the people voted into the national <coughs> and regional assemblies will have something to represent. <coughs> They'll have something to fight for. Okay? But until this, we organize <coughs> the articulation of the will of the people. Our idea as independent constitutions was to have, um, yeah, but I, this is, I've got a very comprehensive uh, issue to deal with, and it simply cannot be done in two minutes. You'd have to read the declaration and think about it and come back with questions. But the basic problem is you've got representative democracy, which means nothing. Because if you want to have meaningful representation, you have to have something to represent. Yeah. Now, how are you going to articulate the will of the people? It's not a question, Alexander, of going back to original values. What we're trying to do is something radically new. It's never been done before. And unless we do it, unless we become responsible for our own destinies, each individual, we will go to the wall as a species and as a planet. So we've got to organize participant democracy. Then you can think about, look, most of the politics takes place where people live their lives, which is in the locality. So local politics is absolutely cr crucial. It is already happening on a very minor basis. You have things like participatory budgeting, which are local communities operating their own budgets. We've got to have devolution and subsidiarity. Our system is centralized. Centralized power to do what? One wonders, because most of the politicians, Mrs. Thatcher thought that she could listen to the electorate without bothering about her own parliamentary party. But she, well, she had a tin ear. She couldn't hear what people wanted, really. It was all run by ideology. Now, we have to have a system where we don't have to have recourse to ideology, other people thinking for us. We have to get the electric to think for itself and somehow to articulate that thinking and then represent it. And just very quickly, also, my, my understanding of your question was that, that if, if, de if national democracy is re-empowered, it could actually have negative effects simply because of capital going elsewhere or of other ex yeah. because of the exterior. Yeah. And that is, in fact, what you have articulated as the rationale mm -hmm. for cooperation between something like Simpol and national democratic efforts. That's the whole point. They wish to work yeah. together. Yeah, one very quickly, please. Oh, yes. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to congratulate both of you for the exceptional work that you have uh, and but, and I, I, I'm sincerely, I wish it, it will succeed, you know. And um, I, I read, you see, that I think Chomsky said, let's cry, yes. Uh, can it work? Let's cry, yes. Let's cry. I'm only a bit skeptical about the feasibility. So am I. Because it would, uh, in my opinion, it would work much better in the uh, ideal of the world, you know, uh, with ideal MPs, but uh, MPs are not ideal. They are 
We are not hearing, hearing first and foremost their constituencies or those who have voted for them. We are hearing the voice of lobbies. And lobbies are designing, you know, not only in national parliaments across the world, where there are parliaments, of course, uh, working, if, or, or they are lobbies are writing the draft, lo the draft laws, the draft acts, they, and they hand it to, to MPs that, that they fund, that they support, and not only to MPs, but also to, to top ministers in the cabinet, and so on. And that's, I think it's the, the main, one of the major obstacles that I see is that you are going to have the wall of lobbies. And I know, you see, maybe a sign, you know, because it's very interesting, you had a lot of signatures for uh, 650 candidates, yeah. uh, but only 10%, you see, became MPs. Yeah. So, of course, the, the vast majority of those who signed didn't have many chances of being elected since uh, it is. And uh, um, so, but you, you will, it must be tried, and we will see if you if you succeed in convincing you see, a vast majority, at least for the, at the beginning in a few countries, it would be a serious uh, uh, step forward, of course. You see, it, and uh, the, the experience will, will say yeah, yes or no. Now, just thinking about politics, and you're absolutely right, they do want policy, and they just hand it to politicians. But that's the whole point, is that if we can produce a, a situation where we have a voting block of citizens big enough, where the politicians realise that they do have to answer to the simple voting block, and they can't just accept what is served to them by the think tanks or the police, uh, you know, that's, that's tilting the, the, the pendulum back in the favour of citizens. Yeah, if it comes to that point, you see, you must take into account that lobbies are, are going to move forward towards another step of their strategy and to use soft power to, to, to destroy mm -hmm. them. They've every trick in the book. Mm -hmm. The Constitution forbids people to use money and wealth in order to achieve political leverage. This is a constitutional problem. Mm -hmm. The Constitution has to set up rules for for party political, for funding of political activity. <coughs> and lobbying by a powerful international promoter from one would be totally forbidden constitutionally. It is illegal. It's not one man, one, it's not democracy at all. This has, we have to decide to outlaw it. I think there's a missing ingredient here, that's political parties. Now, if you look around the world at uh, democracies, one of the new phenomena is independent candidates, and you can see there's a push there to innovate. There's, but it's very necessary because the candidates are not uh, the candidates are not uh, responsible or answerable to the electorate, but to their party. They committed to the party program, so that means see, the electorate has very little control of what policy they actually, uh, you know, want. So they have to choose between parties. None of them. Uh, have a program that the, the individual citizen might like. Mm -hmm. So I think the innovation needs to be that candidates are answerable or have to commit to policy points that their electorate want and to make them impeachable mm -hmm. if they vote against their, their mm -hmm. declared policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can be removed. Sorry, let me talk about uh, Immediately. Thomas, it's exactly what we mean by independent yeah. politics. It's independent, non-adversarial, non-party political politics. Candidates and MPs are primarily answerable to their constituencies and not to political parties, which is horizontal. It's bottom-up democracy, not top-down or horizontal. So I entirely agree with you. I finished the portion how we sort of put the current system on uh, the uh, oh. uh, artificial yeah. long respiratory yeah. 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 But sure. uh, uh, my uh, other part is dedicated to the possibility of alternative system. And I wanted just to say that, you know, there was an uh, 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 excellent uh, uh, sociologist, uh, Austrian sociologist, uh, uh, Ul uh, Ulrich Becker. 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 Yes. Yes. 
Exactly. He uh, wrote an excellent book on uh, metamorphosis of the world and risk societies before. And uh, indeed, I wanted to borrow this uh, uh, emblem, I would say, the risk society. We all live today in the risk societies, which practically, I'm not going again to the details, it requires new global domestic politics today, which is absolutely inevitable because the rules that are uh, established should be open and ended. They should be constantly negotiated, not only on uh, the in, in national and international spheres, but also between global uh, business and state, international civil society, supranational organizations and national governments and organizations. And uh, we are, in fact, going to this plurilateral model because uh, it's not only multilateral si system, or it's on different levels, and they, these levels should be connected. Then I think that we should need to, to transit from representative to collaborative, and then a deliberative system of, uh, uh, of uh, democracy. Because, uh, uh, and uh, it is called by somebody, I don't remember, who coined it collabocracy, uh, which is another nice state, uh, term. Decision making from collective need to be switched to collaborative levels. And uh, seemingly, they sounds very much alike, but they're totally different. Collective intelligence is based on, today, on voting systems. Uh, and uh, choosing one of the options. The question, you answer one or another. Uh, collaborative intelligence, it, it, it uses uh, uh, quant qualitative, let me say, approach to that. And uh, it's uh, made to, of solving problems and makes decisions based on verification of feasible models. Science is actually based on that. In science, you never can achieve a result by voting. And I think that similar switch is required for the democratic system. So uh, uh, the, the, the decision making should be uh, up to the complexity of the modern social <laughs> challenges in society and global, global problems that they uh, simply will very soon will not be able to be resolved by uh, uh, voting. And I would say that mm, these mechanisms of collaborative nature will demand a huge involvement of scientific experts in the decision-making process. And education. Education of the people who are voting. You know, yeah. Yeah. education is very important to give the right questions to the public. Well, well, as long as the questions are devised by one <coughs> single or elite person, that is already manipulation of, by, of those who are answering this question. Good information. Yeah. What you've just suggested is precisely what we are suggesting, is what we mean by collaborative participatory democracy. The representation is an afterthought. Uh, Michael, I, 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 I'm sorry. My response, and I said that I'm not convinced, was that I cannot uh, see any magic button. And therefore, I thought that it was uh, suggest magic button by which you could reset all. But I uh, did not, uh, I thought that it was presented as exactly such a magic button. Oh, no, 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 no,
Alexander raised the question of interplay of law, science, and policy in this larger context of political culture. But the thing that is not, I think, adequately understood is the role of constitutional legal culture. And, and, and it's a hard sell politically, yet the most fundamental components of accountability, responsibility, and transparency are rooted in the idea of the constitutional political culture. And that is what we really need. You know, that's why I like to say. Well, thank you very much.